compares an akazo so that my household can be full. So when a principality brings government, you need another agent to compare people to come. You can build a church, but to be empty if it is scripture. And anything that we feel is not scripture, we must approach it from the standpoint of scripture. Our personal opinions must be removed completely from the way. If you hear something that is not clear, find out what the scriptures say and use only scripture to explain it. Forget whoever talked about it. Whether he's a bishop, a prophet, or an apostle, or whether he's a novice, it doesn't matter. Let it be based on scripture. When Paul was teaching, he said, the Berean Christians were more noble than those in Thessalonica because when they heard the word, he said they went back to search to see whether the things that were said are true. So when you hear doctrinal issues, don't be quick on the strength of your opinion to begin to attack it. Write it down. Go back and do a research around it before you bring a response. Don't just respond because you felt what you knew was right. It could be a position of pride. And don't just begin to attack it because you heard somebody very big said it. It could be an erroneous position. And you need to understand that you can never be grounded until you understand doctrines in their depth and in their accuracy. Number two, when you begin to hear, don't be in a rush to make any statement. Be patient to hear it to the end. Because sometimes a portion of it may sound very extreme until you hear the whole truth and view it through the complete spectrum. You can never be sure whether you are right or wrong. So be patient to hear it what? To the end before you bring your position. I am burdened in my spirit to explain and to teach on doctrine this morning. And because I want to start from the beginning, I will touch on the doctrine of salvation this morning. Because a lot of people are struggling with all kinds of iniquity, all kinds of sin. They don't know what to do. They've tried their best. For the past 10 years, they've been struggling with masturbation. They have fasted. They have done all forms of penance yet they are still in masturbation. What is the problem? There are lots of people that have struggled with things they can't even tell their pastors because they've told many men of God and they have received many recommendations, yet it didn't work. So we need to understand the doctrine of salvation. Meanwhile, the doctrine of salvation is threefold. First, delivering you from sin it makes you a child of God. That's the first thing the doctrine of salvation does. It delivers you from sin and it makes you a child of God. So everyone that understands the doctrine of salvation and responds becomes a legitimate child of God. Number two, what it does is that progressively it makes you grow from a child to a son. And then number three, it will lead you to a place where you grow into a father. So the doctrine of salvation does not just begin and end with you were delivered from sin. It will lead you into the experience of righteousness until you become a, a son of God. It will also lead you to the place where you come into fatherhood. So salvation is to the uttermost. It doesn't leave you as a babe struggling with sin. You have not fully understood it. And it doesn't save you and then keep you in the place of uncertainty. Whether you are saved when you eventually leave this world. It will bring you to a point of absolute assurance. In fact, the Bible said, Herein we have boldness in the day of judgment. That as he is, so are we in this world. So here and now, we have assurance that the day we confront that judgment seat, we will not come there hoping whether we'll be saved or not. We will not come there with fear whether we'll be condemned. He said we will come with boldness, with absolute assurance in the day of judgment. So when a man understands the doctrine of salvation, five things happen to him. The first thing that happens to him is that his relationship with God is restored. Obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. When you understand 
the doctrine of salvation, the first thing that happens to you is that your fellowship, your relationship with God is restored. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, it said, To which God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses against them, but he gave unto them the word of reconciliation. The reason is because one of the things Adam lost in the garden was fellowship. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, it said, In the cool of the day, the voice of God came walking in the garden. I shared with us yesterday how God would abandon his, his excellency and everything to come have fellowship with Adam in the garden. But when Adam fell, he was driven from the presence of God. So in the gospel of salvation, as I will explain the dynamics to us, the Bible said God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses against them, but giving unto them the word of reconciliation. So fellowship is restored in salvation. This is why even when a man falls, he runs back to God. He doesn't run away from God. If fellowship were not restored, the day you make one mistake, you are finished. Like Adam, you'd have been driven from the presence of God. But the reason we have the boldness to come to God in the first place to confess our sins is because we know that something has been made intact and possible, which is our fellowship. So it gives us assurance of fellowship and beyond that assurance, it also provokes an appetite to sustain that fellowship. Number two, what happens to us when we receive the gospel of salvation is that we receive eternal life. The life of God. There are three realms of life. There is the biological life called the bios. If, you, if, the hand, if somebody's hand or a part of an animal is cut off for a while, that part will still be shaking because that life is still in it. The animal life is in the blood. According to Leviticus chapter 11 verse 17, it said the life of the man is in the blood. That's the animal life. It's in the blood. It's called bios. But that life cannot give you eternity with God. Number two, there is the soulish life called the suche. So everybody, whether a sinner or a good person, understands moral laws. He knows good and evil. He reasons, he thinks. Because there is a life that powers it. But beyond the soulish life and the animal life, there is the life of God called the Zoe. Giving us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He said, whoever has the son has life. So you don't know you have life because you felt it. You know you have life because there is a testimony that whoever has the son has life. Whoever has the son has life. And he said, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Why is this so important? Because victory in life is predicated upon the kind of life that you have. He said, whoever is born of God overcometh the world. He said, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So our victory in life, which is provoked by our faith, is predicated upon the quality of life that we have. So if a man does not know that he has the life of God, watch him, he will always be defeated because he will be looking for victory from an external standpoint. So when somebody is not there to support him, when there is no assistance, he feels defeated. But the man that knows he has the life of God, he knows his victory is resident on his inside. So no matter how difficult the crisis is, give him time. He will go to his room and stare that life. And when he provokes that life, he comes out as a champion because his victory is on his inside. So it looks simple. But this is where power dwells in the life of a man. An assurance that the same life that sustains God is on his inside. So he knows that he functions in the class of God. This is why Jesus said, even if we drink any deadly thing, it shall by no means, not because we are apostles, not because we are prophets, but because we have that life that is in God. So if God cannot be destroyed, you cannot be destroyed. If God cannot be defeated, you cannot be defeated. So as simple as this scripture is, the totality of your victory in life is resident upon this truth. And it's in the gospel of salvation that eternal life is handed over to us. You know, 
the most powerful things in the gospel are actually the simplest things. That's why very few people walk in power. Because they are looking for something complex and something big. And they never do enough. Yet you see somebody come with the simple and very basic things of the gospel. And then you see terrible things happening that you can't explain. God designed it so, so that you can't take the glory. If it is something very complex, you can claim that it's because you did something so complex. That's why you have it. But if it's something so simple that even a child can understand, then you cannot take the glory. He said, lay hands on the sick, they will recover. Don't come and speak capital letter tongues. Just lay hands on the sick. So if you lay hands on the sick and they recover, you will know that it's not because of anything but God. But the reason you lay hands on the sick, they recover, is because there's a life flowing out of you. So what we receive in salvation is what? Eternal life. When a man understands salvation, he knows he has eternal life. Number three, what a man receives in salvation is restoration into the kingdom. So the man now has the right to participate in the kingdom. In John chapter 3 verse 3, he said, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So our acceptance and our admission into the kingdom of God is predicated upon our understanding and response to the gospel of salvation. Now, if you are not in the kingdom of God, you can't be relevant with God. Because every assignment and every mandate God has is for those who are in his kingdom. So a man has to be born again to come into the kingdom of God. So when we talk about the kingdom of God, we are talking about the basis for reward in eternity. But all of that is possible because you have understood and received the gospel of salvation. Number four, what the gospel of salvation does is that it reveals to us the love of the Father. And as I proceed, I will explain to you the implication of the love of the Father. Most times when you share what God did in salvation, a lot of people will say, Kai, you are telling people to go and walk in sin. No. When salvation is taught in its purest form, a man will see the love of God. And if a man sees the love of God, amongst other things, there is something the love of God does for him. In 2 Corinthians 5.14, it said the love of God constraineth us. So when a man can see love through the gospel preached, love will constrain him. So the reason we walk in righteousness is not because we are afraid of judgment. And I will show you scriptures when I proceed. The reason we walk in righteousness is because we are constrained by love. You, don't, you are not faithful to your wife because you are afraid your wife will kill you. You are faithful to your wife because love provokes fidelity. So he said, for God so loved the world. John chapter 3 verse 16 that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. So the gospel of salvation reveals to us the love of the father. And finally the gospel of salvation exonerates us from the messianic judgment. He said whosoever believeth should what? Not perish. Should not perish but to have eternal life. Number two he said, they that believe on me, they have passed from death to life. They have passed. He didn't say they will pass. He didn't say they are passing. He said they have passed from death to life. So when a man understands the gospel of salvation, five things happen to him amongst other things. One, his, his fellowship with God is restored. Number two, he receives eternal life. Number three, he is restored to the kingdom Number four, the love of God is revealed to him. And number five, he is exonerated from the messianic judgment. So what is the dynamic of the gospel of salvation? The first thing we need to understand about the dynamic of the gospel of salvation is to understand the person of God. When you study the scriptures and you understand the person of God, there are three things that you will find. The first thing is that God is holy. The revelation of God's holiness is the highest revelation of God. Because the word holiness means to exist in his own class, separate from all things. So in holiness, 
every other factor about God that you pick out is in his own class. For example, you can say God is love. Now, the love of God is also a revelation of the holiness of God because the love of God is distinct from every other kind of love. That's why God compares his love with the love of a father and a mother. He said, as, 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 as wicked as your earthly parents are, will you ask them for bread and they give you stone? Or will you ask them for fish and they give you serpent? He said, how much more your heavenly father is willing to give unto you the kingdom? Matthew 7 verse 7. What was God trying to do? The love of your father, the love of your mother. Meanwhile, it's important for you to know that mothers are willing to, to die a thousand times for their children. In the physical context, there is no love as potent as the love a mother has for a child. But God was telling us that the love of a mother compared to the love of God is wickedness. That's why I said, as wicked as your earthly parents are. So when we talk about the love of God, the love of God is also a revelation of God's holiness. When we talk about the mercy of God, the mercy of God is a revelation of his holiness. When we talk about the power of God, the power of God is a revelation of his holiness. This is why in heaven, God is not known as love. God is not known as light. The only name God has in heaven is holy. The angels of God forever and ever, they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Because there are different creatures in heaven that exhibit different excellencies of God. For example, Micah is a revelation of the power of God. But Micah compared to God is nothing you can compare. So even though Micah is so much of power compared to God, God is still holy. Because the power of God is not to be compared with what Michael carries. So with all the excellencies in heaven, the only way God can be adored, worshipped and exalted is to be known and called holy. So the revelation of God's holiness is the highest revelation of God. So he said what? In Leviticus chapter 19 verse 2, Hear, O ye Israel, that the Lord your God is holy. In Exodus 15 verse 11, the Lord your God is holy. Now, if God is holy, it means anything that can exist in the realm of God must also be holy. So if holiness is not your attribute, you cannot find expression in the realm of God. Because God is holy, anything that is not holy will be rejected and repelled from God. So every doctrine of salvation that does not provoke holiness is error. Because it cannot bring you into fellowship. The only way you can come into fellowship with God is to have the capacity to function in that class of holiness. So the second thing about God is that God is surrounded by laws. Because God is holy, there are many laws that guard that holiness of God. So without keeping the requirements of those law, you can never come into the realm of God. And I will explain it when I begin to talk about salvation in details. A lot of people assume that when we are saved, because we are saved, we can do what we want. You will notice that in this kingdom, God does not commit kingdom to babes. He said the heir, so long as he's a child, differed nothing from a servant even though he's Lord of all. Who is a child? A child is one whom sins are forgiven. He said, I write unto you, children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. But so long as you are a child, you can't do kingdom business. Because there are laws that necessitate that there is a level and a standard of living that you must attain in order to walk with God. So God is surrounded by laws. Number three, God has wrath for sin. Because God is holy. Everywhere God sees sin, he kills it. So in Romans chapter 6 verse 23, he said, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Remember, love cannot exempt you from the judgment of God. The wrath of God will kill you regardless of who you are. And I will give you the most potent illustration. Jesus, who is part of the deity, he is part of the Godhead. The moment sin was put on Christ, God did not say, no, this is Jesus. 
he is co-equal with me. He co-heirs with me. The moment sin came on Jesus Christ, God killed him. So nobody will be exempted or exonerated from the wrath of God if sin is on his life. If Jesus became sin and God will not create an exception for Jesus, no sinner will escape the wrath of God. God will kill every sinner. God will destroy every sinner because when his own son became sin, he killed him. So every other person that bears the mark of sin, God will destroy him. Now, considering this simple single, this fact that God is holy, God has laws around him, and God has wrath that kills every sinner. How can sinful man now have fellowship with God? This is the first puzzle in the gospel of salvation. God is holy, God has laws, and God has wrath. How can sinful man have fellowship with God? This is what the dynamics, the gospel of salvation tries not only to explain but to grant unto man. And the way to understand it is first of all to understand the dynamics of righteousness and the dynamics of sin. I'm taking it gradually because there are certain statements I will make as I proceed that will be very radical. But before I begin to make those statements and then balance them at the end, you have already known my foundation. That God is holy, God has laws that judges sin, and God has wrath that kills the sinner. Right? Is that foundation well established? Now, before I proceed, let me explain the dynamics of sin. There are four things you need to know about sin. The first thing you need to know about sin is that sin, according to 1 John chapter 3 verse 4, is the transgression of the law. So long as God is holy, God must walk with laws. So long as God is holy, God must have wrath against sin. Now, everything that transgresses the laws of God, the Bible calls it sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John chapter 3 verse 4. Number 2, the law it's not just what Moses received on the mountain. Because Jesus came and redefined the law. For example, Moses said, if you take another man's wife and you have carnal knowledge of her, you have committed adultery. Then Jesus now came and said, I gave Moses the law, but he didn't interpret it well. And so in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 and 28, Jesus says, it's not when you take the woman and have carnal knowledge of her. He said, if you look upon her lustfully, you have already committed adultery with her in your heart. So everything that dents the image of God is sin. Now, when you talk about sin, some people assume that it's either when you lie, or when you commit murder, or when you fornicate. So in their pride, because they don't lie, because they don't fornicate, because they don't, they've not murdered anybody, they assume they don't, they are sinless. He said, everything that goes on in your heart is directly proportional to everything you do in the physical. I'm saying this so that you will know how much of grace you need. Because if you don't know it, you will assume that with your willpower, you will fulfill grace. So, in the Old Testament, for 1,500 years, they were trying to keep the demands of God. And the Bible said, there is none righteous, not one. 1,500 years, it said there is none righteous, not one. The reason is because sin is much more than what you think it is. And then, as if it didn't end there, John, Paul now came to go deeper. And in Romans 14 verse 23, Paul said, whatever is not of faith is sin. So fear is sin. And fear will receive the same judgment as immorality. Anxiety is sin. Have you been there before when they gave you a promise and it was two hours to the time and you couldn't stand your ground anymore? You start pacing everywhere. Or you want to come for a program and it was 30 minutes to the meeting and the technical people are not yet ready. And then you wake up, you are walking. What is happening? What, 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 why is this thing you have become anxious. 
you are no longer functioning by faith, it's sin. And that your anxiety is equivalent to a man who just fornicated and came to mount the altar. So you who were anxious about, you didn't even know you did anything wrong because fear have hit your heart and you have become anxious. In the scales of God, you are equal with a man who just stood up from fornication and came to the altar. Look at what James said. <laughs> you know, people don't appreciate grace. Look at what James said. In James chapter 2 verse 10, James said, if you fought in one, you are guilty of all. So the man who was afraid is the same with the man who fornicated. Because the day he was afraid, that day he fornicated. That day he lied. That day he killed. That day he committed murder. That day he, he coveted. Because when you break one, you break all. And whatever is not of faith is sin. Do you have an idea, a fair understanding of what sin is? Why am I explaining this? So that every day of your life you will put your faith in Jesus Christ. You will see the futility in putting your faith in yourself. Because most times when we want to teach certain things, we teach it from the context of our own morality or our own opinion. We can't meet the standard of God like that. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And if you are guilty in one, you are guilty in all. Having set this background, I need to explain the three things that makes for salvation. The first is what we call the doctrine of substitution. The second is what we call the doctrine of forgiveness. The third is what we call the doctrine of righteousness. And the fourth is what we call the doctrine of justification by faith. Do I go over it again? The doctrine of what? Substitution. The doctrine of forgiveness. The doctrine of righteousness. And the doctrine of justification. Many believers don't understand this. They are the first things to know in Christendom. Very simple, very basic, but many don't know it. When we talk about sin, they begin to threaten everybody. <laughs> That's why after threatening them, they now go and start living in secret sin. Because our threatening them and scolding them have not helped them. When you watch families and parents raise children, most times, house is when they want to kill children with quarrel and beating. Most children who rise from those homes become hardened. Very hardened, very criminal in nature. But houses where children are exposed to understanding truth, they explain it to them in love, they correct them. If there is need to beat them, they beat them. But beating is not a weapon that is used every day to bring the child either to fear or to criminal tendencies. But when a child errs, the father corrects the child, sits the child down and explains to the child why this should not be done and explains it again and again shows the child the danger and all of that and then show the child love you see such children grow very healthy most times in families where children are, are so handled with, with, with iron hands so to say in African sense such children even lose the confidence to work out their destiny they can't even sit where people are talking tell them to come and express themselves they are afraid so they can't give expression to the things God has put on their inside because they killed it in a bid to raise them up. Is it? Is God against uprightness? He said, if you spare, he said, him that loveth the child will not spare the rod. Because when you spare the rod, you destroy the child. However, the corrections and the rebuke of God is for restoration. So we see all of this balance as we explain the gospel of salvation. And when we explain it, you will see the love of God. You will see restoration of fellowship. You will see imputation of eternal life. You will see admission into the kingdom. And you will see exoneration of the messianic judgment. First thing we need to see is 
the doctrine of substitution. In the doctrine of substitution, it's very simple. God said the wages of sin is death. And he said, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means everybody in the sight of God is dead. And what God is waiting for is for judgment upon them. So what will God do since he doesn't want to kill man? I told us yesterday or the first day the balance of the judgment of God. I told us that the wrath of God said man must die because man is a sinner. I told us the mercy of God said what? Mercy prevails over judgment. But the righteousness of God won't let God. So what will God do? The love of God necessitates that God dies in the place of man. And then finally the grace of God empowers man not to sin again. That's the equation of substitution. In substitution, God saw that man is worthy of death. And there is nothing man can do about it. Even if he tries it for the entire allocation of time for the human race. So what God decided to do was that you are worthy of death. So what I will do is that I will take your place and die on your account. So having died on your account, everything you deserve, I will take it. So in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it said he made him that was without sin to become sin for us that we will become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So when Jesus was on the cross, Jesus was taking the place of man. So everything man deserves, which is death, which is condemnation, which is wrath, was all put on Jesus Christ. This is why Jesus died. Now, if you see it, that you didn't have anything to give to God, to be able to receive this level of benevolence, what does it do to you? You will only return gratitude to him. This is why in 2 Corinthians 5.14, Paul said, the love of Christ constrains us. For we thus judge that if one died for all, then they that live should no longer live unto themselves, but for him that died for them. So on the cross, Jesus took your place. The idea behind the cross, the whole doctrine around the cross is the death of the old man. So when we look at the cross of Jesus, we are not seeing the Son of God hanging, punished, and condemned. When we look at the cross of Jesus, we are looking at our old man being crucified on the cross. Because that person there is not just Christ. That person there now is me. Christ taking my place. In a very simplistic sense, I'm owing you a thousand Ghana cities. And then somebody else comes to pay. I have paid. So the person who paid logically is me. Because he substituted for me. So when a man understands the cross, he will now know that it was him who was nailed. It was him who was crucified. So when you tell that man, you will be judged. He will tell you, I've already been judged. Because when Jesus was nailed, I was nailed. When Jesus was crucified, I was crucified. In Romans chapter 5 verse 4, it said we were included in the likeness of his death. Now, many people cannot believe it. So many times, they come, they are struggling to do something. They are struggling to, they are attempting to do something. Every time you struggle to do it, it means you are still alive in yourself. Every time you are confronted, what you need to do is to submit to the judgment of the cross. So every attempt to get it done is an attempt in futility. This is why you struggle with lying, you will keep struggling. This is why you struggle with masturbation, you will keep struggling. The day you say no, lying was crucified. The day you say no, masturbation was crucified, you will be amazed because that's what God is waiting for. The day you acknowledge it, something happens to you. The power of God that gives you the experience is released so that you will never take the glory that is because I did this, that's why I stopped. It's because I did that. That's why I stopped. Everybody that ever stopped living in sin surrendered to the cross. There is no way you can stop. The power that will make you live above it can never be released until you surrender to the cross because God must first of all kill 
before he can make a life. Because the power to live above sin is not yours. It's God that imparts it. But the only time God will impart that power is when you surrender to the cross. So what the cross does, the revelation of the cross is that you have been killed. And if you have been killed, how come you can still do what you still do? So most times, and I will, when I begin to talk to you about how to live above sin, I will show you how to appropriate the cross. I'm just showing you the legal transaction that took place. So legally speaking from the realm of God, as far as it's concerned, you have been killed, you have been judged, you have been condemned. That's why you don't pray in your name. If you pray in your name, God won't hear because you are dead. Every time you approach God, you approach God in Christ. So as far as God is concerned, he has dealt with you, he has killed you, he has nailed you, you have died, you have been buried. So you are no longer, if you, are, if you appear before God now, he will say, no, this judgment has been passed. Who is this person? That's the power of substitution. So potent that if you return tomorrow, God will say, no, you are not the one. You will say, Father, I'm the one. He say, no, you are not the one. You are not the one. I can't make mistakes. I'm sure the day you were in Christ, I'm sure I saw you die. I'm so sure. You will tell God, no, I'm the one. He said, no, you are not the one. I've already killed you. That's the power of substitution. That everyone included in Christ have been nailed, have been killed, have been buried. Simple as it is, like ABC, many can't believe it. Number two, the doctrine of forgiveness. No spirit can forgive. When a spirit forgives, that spirit has denied itself or himself. Spirits are not built to forgive. That's why God said the wages of sin is death. He must make sure the person who sinned pays the penalty. The day a spirit forgives, that spirit ceases to be a spirit. So when we talk about the doctrine of forgiveness, it's actually saying something else that English language cannot capture. The word forgive, as used in the Greek, is the word aphesis. It means to wash away. It means to purge. It means to be cleansed. So when God looks, he won't see it. If he sees it, he will kill you. The way he saw it on Jesus, and he killed Jesus Christ. So every time forgiveness is invoked, there is a washing away. The way the north is from the south, the east is far from the west. So has he removed your iniquities away from you. So he said to the apostles to go and preach the doctrine of forgiveness. Am I slow enough? I'm slow enough. So in Acts chapter 26 verse 18, the Bible says, To open their eyes. Because in religion you can't see this. He said to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light. From the power of Satan to God. So the power of God can never be activated in your life until your eyes open. Many people think it's by rules and regulation that they will come out of what they are struggling with. No, it is the release of the power of God that will bring you out. But first, your eyes must be open that they may receive forgiveness of sins. So you don't, you don't fight for it. You don't earn it. You receive it as a free gift from God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified. So forgiveness is received. It is given to you because your eyes are open to believe in what Jesus did on the cross. Now, the dynamics is this. You know, in Romans chapter 4, from verse 6 to verse 8, David was, he saw this possibility in the spirit. David is a prophet. So in his journeys in the spirit, he saw that a day will come when God will not input sin on men. And David began to speak in Romans chapter 4, from verse 6 to verse 8. Of the blessedness of the man to whom God. He said just as David also described the blessedness of the man. To whom God imputed righteousness apart from works. Now the word is not impute. 
is input to put upon. So he didn't labor for it. He didn't qualify for it. Yet God gave it to him. That God made a man righteous who didn't earn it. Now, what were they doing in the law? They were trying to earn it. And for 1,500 years, not one man ended. Ended. So David was saying, how blessed is this man whom God will allocate righteousness to who did not labor to deserve it or to earn it. And then he went further. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. So a time is coming when God can let go of people's lawlessness. This same God that if you see, he kills you. So a time is coming. That, now this is Paul trying to teach here. And I will show you the three reactions that happen when this is taught. He says, so there is a time coming when people can be lawless and God will put it away. How is that possible? Even men are just enough to know that every sin should be recompensed. How come God will forget and cover? Imagine what happened. That a man's sin is covered. God covers it. Is God not supposed to be just? Why will God cover a man's sin? These were David's lamentations. He couldn't understand it. A day is coming. And in verse 8, hear what David said. He said, blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. He didn't say the man who does not sin. He said, the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. That means the man sins, but God refused to impute the sin on him. Does this not sound dangerous? <laughs> does this not sound dangerous? Now, look at what Paul now said in Romans chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. We are, you know, we are afraid of teaching this because we feel when we say it, we will give people license to sin. But it doesn't work like that. That's why I say here to the end. See what Paul said. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 19. He said, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not in putting their sins against them. Not in putting their sins against them. Can you, can you believe that? Does this not look as if you are giving people license to sin? That God is not in putting their sins against them. Can <laughs> it's, it's strange. It's scary. This is why you don't attempt to teach doctrine until you have time. Because imagine if somebody stops here and goes out. He will say, thank God. God is not putting my sin against me so I can do whatever I want. Don't teach people doctrine until you can keep them to the end. Because I will also show you the dangers of lasciviousness. But he said, this is the blessing that God is not inputting. So, does God mean he's giving people ticket to sin? No. The same provision that makes God not to input sin is also the provision that empowers the man not to sin at all. Because the goal of God is not to forgive your sin. The goal of God is to bring you to a place where you are above sin. So the journey begins from not imputing sin. The journey begins from forgiveness. But the journey doesn't stop there. The journey ends when you no longer sin, you now lose the capacity to sin. But you will never come to the point where you lose the capacity to sin until first of all you accept that there is a power that exonerates you from sin. It is that power that exonerates you from sin that also gives you the capacity to live above sin. So many people don't accept this. Then they now start struggling to live above sin. If you don't receive this power, where the activation is, you cannot walk in the experience. But why does God not input sin? It's in verse 17. Whoever is in Christ Jesus. If you are in Christ Jesus, then God is not inputting sin. That's what Paul is teaching. If you are in Christ Jesus, God is not inputting Do you see Paul? Oh, Paul is a lawyer. So he knows judgment very well. He understands judgment very well. He said, if you are in Christ Jesus, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And the reason is because he said, God was in Christ 
reconciling you to himself. Not inputting. Because if God inputs sin on you, before he reconciles you, he will kill you. Because the moment is rough, see the sin, he will kill you. So God has to not input sin on you before he can even reconcile you. Now, if you go to Romans chapter 3, from verse 25 to 26, see what Paul said. It's called the doctrine of forgiveness of sins. It says, whom God, talking about Jesus, set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because, of his, because in his forbearance, God passed over the sins that were previously committed. God passed over the sins that were previously committed in his forbearance. But the reason God was able to forbear is because of the testimony of the blood. The blood that will be shed will wipe away the sins. So because of the wipe away, the sins of the past, God let go of it. And God didn't stop there. He now went to verse 26. See what God said. In the present, to demonstrate at this present time his righteousness, that he might be the just, that he might be just, and the justifier of those whom has faith. So God is not just doing these things in the past. He's also doing it now. And God doesn't stop there. In doing this thing, God is just. And God is also the justifier of those that have faith. Now, what does this mean? What does this mean? I'm building up, okay? Just be patient, be patient. You will think I'm giving you a license to sin. When I finish, you will not only abhor sin, you will become potent, stronger than sin, that you will be able to live above it, not by rules and regulations, but by the workings of the power of God on your inside. Yes. It said, God, what? That he may be just and the justifier of what? Those that believe in his name. But how did God do this? He said it's by the testimony of the blood. Now, take for example, if your sins are not forgiven, why do you go to God to ask for forgiveness? It would have been a wasted effort. The reason you come to ask for, for forgiveness in the first place is because you know that that provision is available. If it were not available, why do you go to ask? Are you not psyching yourself? Are you not deceiving yourself? The reason you go to ask in the first place is because you know it's available. Now, this is the problem with us most times. Many people assume that if you tell people confess your sins, then they will not continue in sin. But if you tell people that they are forgiven, you are giving them a license to sin. Now, see the problem. When a man thinks it's because he cried that God forgave him, then every time he sins, he comes and cries. But I tell you, if not for the blood, if you like, cry until you cry to death, you will still be condemned. Your cry doesn't move God as touching this matter. His justice will not allow it. Mama is a lawyer. Imagine if I killed somebody and I come to court and start crying. When I cry, they will give me a dozen handkerchief to clean my eyes. When I finish crying, they will now say, the penalty for murder is death. Go and die. No tears can stop the judgment. So the idea is not about the tears. It's about the testimony of the blood. So in verse 25 it says, it's because of the blood that forgiveness is made available. And the reason is because it's the blood that washes your sins away. The cross kills the man of sin. But the blood washes the sins away from the man. So in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12 and verse 14, See what the Bible said. It said, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered into the holy place once and for all, having obtained for us eternal redemption. See what verse 14 says. It says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, now he's comparing with the blood of bulls and calves. He said, if the blood of bulls and calves cannot wash away sins, how much more with the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleans our conscience from dead works. Two things he's saying here. If a man doesn't believe in the verdict of forgiveness, it means that man undermine the blood of Jesus. If a man at any point fails to believe that he is forgiven, 
He's actually not failing to believe he's forgiven. He's actually saying that the blood of Jesus is not potent enough to do the job. And number two, if a man does not believe in what that blood has done, his conscience can never be cleansed from sin. And so long as his conscience is not in alignment, he said his faith will be shipwrecked. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 19, he said, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have shipwrecked their faith. So it is your conscience that makes your faith work. And the way your conscience will work is when you believe in what the blood has done. Because the blood is what cleanses your conscience from dead works. So when a man's conscience is healthy, a man's faith is healthy. When a man's faith is healthy, he can do good works. So every time we talk about forgiveness, we're actually talking about the blood. God doesn't forgive you because of you. God forgives you because he sees the blood of Jesus. This is why God commands us to forgive the same way we are forgiven. So when God tells you to forgive your brother, he didn't tell you to forgive your brother because your brother is reasonable. Because you too were not forgiven because you are reasonable. You were forgiven because God saw the blood of Jesus. So Peter came to Jesus and said, how many times have my brother sinned against me and I forgive him? And Jesus said, 70 times, 7 times. That's 490 times in a day. Is God encouraging your brother to offend you? No. God is showing you how God works. Imagine if God is telling you, forgive your brother 70 times, 7 times in a day. That means your God is giving your brother the license to offend you. Because if God tells me that you will forgive me 490 times in a day, that means I'm at liberty to wrong you 400 times in one day. Imagine if you had 10 brothers. So forgiveness is not because you are reasonable. Forgiveness is because of the price that was paid. And if God is telling you to forget, forgive one man 490 times in one day, imagine God himself, how many times he can forgive? It is eternal. People don't understand this. That's why they are not bold before God. He say, come boldly before the throne of grace. I didn't come boldly to the throne of grace because I am spotless. I came boldly before the throne of grace because the blood is speaking on my account. This is why I can come to God any day, any time. But there are many proud people. Every time they come to God, they believe it's because they fasted. They are just coming down from 40 days fast. So they are feeling holy. And because they are feeling holy, they can come and speak with audacity. When they are coming to minister, if they came from seven days dry fast, they can decree over Ghana. But the day they didn't fast, they don't feel God so much. So they come and they say, you know, God will help us. But the day they have helped themselves, that day they can make both decree. We don't know how God feels. You don't know how God feels when man is so proud. A man comes before God and feels he can help himself. Because he prayed some prayer, he will attract indignation. Whether you fasted or you prayed, whether you cut yourself with a razor blade, the only basis by which God forgives you is the blood of Jesus. So every time we come before the Lord, we come with gratitude and our faith in Christ Jesus. This is why you can never take the glory. Because nothing you do would have been able to help you. It's only what Jesus did that is able to help you. This is the doctrine of forgiveness. Now, when God forgave man, he didn't just say, okay, go, you are forgiven. If God said, go, you are forgiven, when you come, the angels will stop you. Because they are not aware, how dare you come here? When Adam sinned, he said a cherubim stood at the gate with sword turning on every side. The angels will kill you if you come close. Because they didn't know what God said. So in order for you to have right in the realm of God, God didn't just forgive you. He declared you righteous. Sometimes we need to go and study these words and know what they mean. Righteous means without offense. That means you can now participate in the realm of the holy gods. Remember, I began from the beginning by telling you that God is holy. So you can't function in God's realm until you are like him. So what God did was that he gave you a badge of righteousness. So that any day, any time, you have the right of participation in his realm. So whether the angels like it or not, you have that right. So God did not just forgive your sin. He declared you righteous. 
So in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it said he made him that was without sin to become sin for us so that we will become the righteousness of God. Do you know why we are bold to declare the counsel of God? Do you know why we are bold to address demons? We don't address demons because we prayed and fasted. We address demons because we have the authority of righteousness. We address sickness because we have the authority of righteousness. When the devil wants to kill you, he makes you feel that it's what you do that gave you qualification before God. And because what you do is not always constant, some days you are down, some days you are up. So while God is working on you, it's important for you to know that today you have rights with God. Not just privileges. He says, as many as believe, to them he gave the right, not the privilege. If it's a privilege, you can lose it sometimes. But if it's a right, it means you can make demand on it. That's why I may have a privilege to come into Ghana by reason of visa on arrival. But you who is a Ghanaian citizen, you can argue with the police. I don't have the right to argue with the police because I'm not Ghanaian. But you who has citizenship here, you can stand and say, why do you think this will happen? The reason is not because you were fair, tall, black or white. It's because you are Ghanaian. So you are a citizen of this, king, of this kingdom. And because you are a citizen of this kingdom, you have rights. And that right, if they attempt to take it away, even if it's your president, you can appeal it in court. Because it's not a privilege. You are not a Ghanaian by privilege. You are a Ghanaian by right. So what God did to us after forgiveness is that he gave us the right into his realm. So we are not children of God by privilege. We are children of God by right. So when I need something, I make demand for it. I don't beg for it. If you were not forgiven, you wouldn't have that right. I make demands. When something is going wrong, I command it to change. I don't beg for things to change. I command things to change. But where does all of that authority come from? From my simple understanding that I've been declared the righteousness of God. And God didn't stop there. He went further to the doctrine of justification. In Romans chapter 4 from verse 25, see what the Lord said. See what the Bible says. Write these scriptures down. Go and read them for yourself. There are many things I can't say now. Write it down. You'll be amazed the level of religion that have entered our, our, our churches. He said, who was delivered because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification? Now, in Romans 5.1, see what the Bible now says. He said, being freely justified by faith, now we have peace with God. Not freely living above offense, but freely being justified. Now, we have peace with God. Why do you think you can come to God to ask for forgiveness? Because God has peace with you. If God were not at peace with you, his presence will lick you up. The sons of Aaron violated God and they went to the mercy seat. The mercy seat is supposed to be what? The place of perfect assurance. But they were killed before the mercy seat. So if you don't have peace with God, there won't even be a basis to approach him. His presence will lick you up. He said, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. How do we have that peace with God? Is it by doing good? No. It's through our Lord Jesus Christ. So every time we come, it's by Christ. Every time we stand, it's by Christ. We have peace with God. What is the significance of the doctrine of justification? Now, if I was jailed, even if the court decides to let me go there is still a stigma on my life that this is an ex-convict there are many things I can't do because I'm an ex-convict that's a stigma even though my citizenship as a Ghanaian is restored I am an ex-convict there are many positions I cannot vie for there are many things in the country I cannot have because I'm an ex-convict in justification what God did is that he removed the stigma from your life so you are not only righteous, the stigma that makes you an ex-convict is removed. So you are restored to perfect wholeness. What God is trying to do is to balance the equation from his own side. Now having balanced the equation from his own side, 
God now expects you to respond. Are you seeing that now? So everything we have said now is what? A legal transaction. Now there is an experiential dimension to it. Because God say you are righteous. Does not mean you are righteous in character. God did this legal transaction so that from his own part the equation will be settled. He now allows you to be reasonable to respond from your own part. Now there are three kinds of responses. The first response is the response of offense. Paul called it the offense of the cross. The Jewish people were trying to please God for 1,500 years. And Paul comes and said, you have pleased the Lord in Christ Jesus. He said, what do you mean? Are you alright? Do you know how many patriarchs have labored to achieve this? Every day they gave sin offering. Once every year the high priest entered the Holy of Holies to pour blood on the mercy seat for them to have peace with God. And then you come. You say we don't need the rituals that have existed for 1,500 years. You are trying to tell us that right now we have peace with God. Are you alright? Get out from here. They even wanted to kill him. Others came and said, what do you mean? Do you mean everything we did in the past was a waste of time? Are you trying to say that we are, we are righteous even without doing everything that the law commands? And Paul said yes. And they were offended at him. So that's the first response of man. It's the response of offense. Not because man doesn't want to accept what God says. But man naturally feels he should earn what he has. Because of the pride that is on his inside. So if you don't give man a basis to earn it, he doesn't want to receive it. Because he feels that if he receives it without earning it, there will be no glory for him. Meanwhile, the arrangement God put in place is an arrangement that denies man glory. And that's what man doesn't want. So the Jewish guy wants to do something so that he will take the glory for it. So that he can have something to brag about. But the arrangement the gospel is proposing the man doesn't have anything to brag about. So the natural response of the man is the response of offense. And Paul called it the offense of the cross. The second response of man is the response of religion. Romans chapter 6 verse 1. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Every time you share this gospel, people will ask this question. Are you trying to say we can continue sinning? Because there is grace. It didn't start here. It started from the day of Paul. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And Paul said, God forbid. We can't continue. Part of the provision is a divine allocation that makes you live above sin. So it doesn't encourage sin. Rather, it encourages you not just to live above sin, but to have the power not to sin. So if you preach the gospel of salvation and somebody doesn't confront you, to tell you, are you trying to encourage us to sin? Then you didn't preach it well. Because when Paul preached it, they confronted him. Shall we continue in sin? That grace may abound. Because if you see everything Christ did, and you see that you shouldn't do anything at all, it will give you a cause. As I'm preaching now, there are people who are saying, Kai, 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 this is error. This is error. Some will even say, if you hear this thing and you live in sin, and you sabi oh. I know people are listening online and there will be a lot of contention. Ha! This is what they say and they lead people to sin. Because they think that that religious caution they give will stop them from sinning. You have cautioned people for many years. They are still sinning. Let me show you a scripture that will shock you. In Romans chapter 1 verse 28, see what the Bible says. It said, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do the things which are not fitting. And from verse 29 to verse 31, he began to list all the works of the flesh. And when he listed it, I thought it would stop there. See what he says in verse 32. Romans 1 verse 32. He says, Who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death? They know that people who sin are deserving of death. See what he said. They don't not only do the same, but they approve those who practice it. They know that sin brings death. They go ahead to do it. So people don't stop sinning because they are afraid of hell. What stops men from sinning 
is an awakening of the love of God in their spirit. So in 2 Corinthians 5.14, it says, the love of Christ constrains us. If God does these things when I don't deserve it, and he dies for me, why should I live for myself? When you meditate on these things for a long time, you will arrive at this junction. That junction where you look at yourself and say, no, I'm wicked. No, no, no. I don't deserve this. He died. Now, see what Paul said. He said, hearing God commends his love towards us, that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we know that we don't deserve it. We know we don't earn it. Yet, he died for us. No. No. If this is true, then the only way to live is to live for him. So you don't get people to live above sin by threatening them. You don't get people to live above sin by introducing our moral culture to them. As beautiful as our moral culture are, they don't have the power to make us live above sin. Because this doctrine I've explained to you, it anchors on the blood, the cross, and the resurrection. It's in the blood that sin is washed away. It's in the cross that the old man is killed. And it's in the resurrection that the eternal life, the new life that empowers you to live above sin is imparted. If you don't accept it, you can't walk in it. So the third response of men to the gospel is the response of faith. The first response is what? The response of offense. The second response is what? The response of religion. And the third response is what? The response of faith. 